Okay, let's continue. Uh, we have Peter discussing detectors in weakly coupled quantum field theories. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting. Thanks to the organizers, to the organizers for inviting me. And um, I feel a bit inadequate talking about weakly coupled stuff, but Shai reassured me by giving an, another perturbative talk. Um, but I think it, what I'm going to talk about is not, it, it's not purely uh, weakly coupling, weak coupling. And one of the reasons to talk about weak coupling is that I think these questions are not settled even at weak coupling. So that's a natural place to start, but in principle, it's not a purely weakly coupled discussion. So um, the title of the talk is detectors and weakly coupled field theories. So it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily uh, conformal field theories, although my main examples will be in conformal field theories where things are simpler. Uh, we think that at least some part of our results I keep continue to keep uh, to remain true in the general quantum field theories as well. So let me start with some motivation for what I'm going to talk about. Uh, you know, we like in conformal field theories, for example, to study local operators, and we know that local operators, for example, if I take an example, which was going to be my main example, the uh, Wilson Fisher theory in four minus epsilon dimension. So look at Wilson Fisher. I'm just going to consider the single scalar, so n equals one. So if you think about local operators, then these are things such as you know five x maybe phi squared x, we have things like stress tensors, have spin, have higher spin operators, for example, something like uh, O mu nu rho lambda of x, which is schematically phi with four derivatives, phi plus some corrections to make it into primary and so on. And the reason why we like to think about these operators is because they say, if you think about experiments, they describe long distance limits of uh, some local measurements. So if you do an RG to long distances, you'll find that some local measurements, for example, if you have a lattice and you do some local measurement, maybe let's say on four sites, then at large distances, this kind of measurement is going to be described by um, some sum with some non-universal coefficients, which depend on the kind of difference in scales, but times uh, the local operators of your CFT. And this is the standard story. In this talk, I want to extend this story to other kinds of operators, the ones we call lighter operators, which are not local, but still kind of not completely generic. So for example, uh, one example of such operators is the ANIC operator. So light rail operators. Uh, so one example is let's say null integral of stress tensor. So we take work in Lorentzian signature, we integrate over dx plus t plus plus of uh, at some constant x minus say x minus equals zero, some transverse coordinates y And in, we know that stress and like any operator has many interesting properties, but we can also form other examples. Say should, we can integrate scalars or we can integrate higher spin operators. And of course, there, these are examples of integer spin. There are lighter operators with non-integer spins that I'll mention later. So there are others. 
And uh, so one goal is to give an interpretation, a physical interpretation to these guys. And in the case of stress tensor operator, not like the average Nyinger operator, this was explained by Hoffman and Modesena, uh, who told us that, you know, if you look at this guy, it sits at, on some null plane. So in this case, it's minus equal to zero. Some integral here. So this is our integral of, of t. But in conformal field theory, every null plane is the same. So any null plane can be mapped to a null plane. And one particularly nice null plane is the future null infinity. So one thing you can do is you can move this operator from being in, in null plane x minus equal zero to be an integral along future null infinity. And then this uh, configuration has a nice interpretation. So schematically what we do, if you think about the Penrose diagram, you know, this uh, integral here is some line through the bulk and you can push it to future null infinity and get an integral of future null infinity. And so interpretation of uh, the conformal collider sort of interpretation of this uh, average null energy operator is as follows. So imagine, for example, let's imagine this theory in two plus one dimensions. So let's say you have some maybe uh, quantum critical point, which is described by the Ising universality class. And then you put it on a table, you know, in your lab. And I don't know if you can actually do this, but conceptually you put it on a table in the vacuum state, then maybe you hit it uh, with a hammer in the center. Something happens and start, starts propagating outside. So you put some sort of calorimeter at some point. So this is going to be a calorimeter. And you measure the energy flux far away from where you hit it. And uh, the expected value of this result is just the expectation value of the anic operator in some state, in the state that you created by hitting it with a hammer. So in some sense, then we can say that the stress tensor operator can describe for us some asymptotic measurements in Lorentzian conformal field theories. Or more generally, we can imagine uh, an appropriate generalization to asymptotic measurements in non-conformal theories. Yep. Is it the question? Okay. Are there any questions? Okay. So the question that I want to ask then is what is the physical meaning of these other operators, which we might call light ray operators? And one simple example in which you can completely answer it is in free theory. So let's see what happens in free theory. In free theory, we can, you know, first of all, if we set couplings to zero, so we just have, for example, a free scalar, we can write all these operators in terms of creation, annihilation operators, we have particle interpretations for states. So you can have this like free theory description of what these operators compute. And if you do this, then for example, uh, in case of the spin four operator, we find that it also computes uh, a flux of energy, but it does sli something slightly different from T. So this guy, which is the uh, spin four operator quadratic in the fields defined here, computes the flux, it measures the flux of uh, energy to the power three. So basically, if you were this operator, what would you would do? You would sit here, you would catch particles which fit in some uh, angle delta theta. You'd measure their energy, you would square these energies and every, at everything, sorry, you would take cube of these energies at everything together, and that would be your answer. And this makes sense in free theory because in free theory you have particles. Um, similarly, if you look at uh, general operators quadrat constructed uh, from two fields, then for spin J, this null integral computes uh, flux, something that you can call flux of energy to the power J minus one. 
And the question I want to answer is what happens to these statements when you turn on interactions? So Peter, here you're really assuming Yeah, I'm just looking at the leading twist operators in ah. Wilson Fisher. So, Wilson Fisher example here is not uh, essential. You can do discussion other theories, uh, just that I want to be concrete. In general theories, you would take the operators from the Reggie trajectory of stress tensor. Okay. Now, uh, the part of the problem with before, actually, before I go to the interactions, another thing that we can notice, which is different from um from this local measurements is that since we're not now dealing with this non-local operators we actually can measure energies and in quantum field theory energies have density to be positive so we know that the energies that you measure are positive so in principle it makes sense to ask these questions about flux of g to the minus e to the some power j minus one even for complex j so in free theory we know that We are allowed to just set J in this experiment to any complex number. It's fine because energy is positive. We just ca capture the particles, well, count the particles, measure their energies, put them to the power J minus one, add together. There is no problem with this definition. Um, when we add interactions, on the one hand, we expect that uh, this kind of things should not be allowed. We know that in interacting CFTs, we have IR divergences, and these quantities in general are not IR safe. Measuring energy is a IR safe thing. You can measure energy flux, but measuring something like energy cubed or so on is not IR safe. Then the usual lore is that the reason for this is that you have massless particles, massless particles as interactions can split into collinear uh, massless particles and the quanti quantities like powers of energy are not invariant under the splitting, and in the end, this leads to IR divergences. So, in principle, there is some temptation to just declare this idea dead, the statement's dead, and forget about it. But there is a slight complication with this, which is that we, we can write these expressions even in the interacting theories. So, there is something that we can write, which smoothly connects to free theory operators, you should do this. So we can still ask about the interpretation of these guys. Similarly, for spins which are not integer from the Lorentz inversion formula, we know that um, from the Lorentz inversion formula, we know that we can define light trail operators. We can define analytic continuations of these objects in J for non-integer J. So all these objects that we can define in free theory and give these interpretations, they remain, but the interpretation is less clear. So. Sorry? You can still ask these questions in 2D. Uh, there is like only two directions in which you can measure flux and so anic operator becomes just, you know, L naught uh, or L bar naught. But in principle, you can ask these questions in 2D as well. Uh, any, any other questions? Uh, yeah, very good. You can take do what you said. You can take many stress energy and do some limit, and then you can call that whatever you want. Uh, that's part of the, the point that I'm going to get to. So these things by themselves, like you know, if you could come to me and ask what is what does it mean to measure energy cubed and interacting CFT, I don't know the answer to this. But also in some sense. Uh, if you come to me and ask what does it mean to measure phi squared local operator in the CFT, I also don't know the answer to that. What I know is that if I actually, if you set up maybe some lattice calculation, then I can describe uh, measurements in this lattice, which would be well described by this phi squared. So the slogan of kind of our work partially is that as local operators form a basis for local measurements, lighter operators form a basis for asymptotic measurements. Now, what you call these measurements is up to you, but they have some properties, they have anomalous dimensions, um, and they describe physics in the sense that you can expand asymptotic measurements in this basis 
uh, and in free theory, you can give clear interpretations to them, just that these words lose meaning in uh, safety, but everything else remains. Okay, so so yes, this is the uh, general idea. Basically, I can try to make this kind of analogy between local operators and Lytra operators. So local operators, they form a basis of local measurements. Then uh, Lytra operators form a basis of asymptotic measurements. Well, everything the same. Uh, when we work with local operators, we are used to having divergences. We have UV divergences. We're used to having to renormalize these divergences and get anomalous dimensions for local operators. So this doesn't surprise us. What I said about this kind of observables is that it actually implies that uh, when we do calculations with this kind of flight operators in interacting theories, we'll get IR divergences. So what seems to be slightly unusual here is that just as we are supposed to multiplicatively renormalize EV divergences for local operators, we are supposed to multiplicatively renormalize infrared divergences for uh, light trail operators. And both renormalizations lead to anomalous dimensions. Just here we get anomalous dimensions for local operators, and here we get IR, uh, have here you get anomalous dimensions for light trail operators. Similarly, um, well, not similarly, but local operators, we know that there is a greater state correspondence. Which in some sense explains to us what is the state space of all local operators. You just look at the theory on the sphere and you look at the states and this is the same as the space of local operators. So there's some objective characterization of what the space of local operators is. and an analogous statement for light operators, we don't know. So part of the motivation for this project and I think one of the things that we try to answer is what is the space of these operators? We don't have any nice statement like this, but we are just explo exploring what operators are there and what, what properties they have and how they interact with each other. Any questions? Okay. All right. So. It's in, from the point of view of perturbation theory. So the non-perturbatively, if you don't think about perturbation theory, we just say that they are well-defined and uh, have some anomalous dimensions. Sorry? Well, you can compute. I think I don't not understand the question. You can compute expectation values of light ray operators in various states, in particular in states created by a primary operator in the CFT. Uh, if you're just thinking about some non non perturbative CFT, which is just is a theory, there is no perturbation theory that's attached to it. Uh, then these operators just exist in the same sense as local operators exist. But if you try to start with free theory and do perturbation th theory on top of it to get to your CFT, then you have to do UV regularize UV divergences for local operators and for light operators you have to do the same it's just that the UV divergences are replaced by IR divergences yeah yeah uh, if you integrate along a null line here, so I'll explain the precise thing that we do. The answer is yes, but um, 
the thing is, it really depends on where you integrate it because in perturbation theory, the um, conformal invariance is not exact. It's kind of corrected. So if you do something to local operator, it doesn't mean that, like if you have some perturbative expression for a local operator, it doesn't mean that now you can do whatever you want to this uh, perturbative expression. For example, if you send, send the local operators to infinity, then this thing that you did to the local operator at finite x doesn't work anymore at infinity. So when you're integrating local operator along future null infinity, the thing that you're supposed to do to it for this to make sense is different from what you're supposed to do to a local operator for it to make sense at finite x. Because there is no relation from the point of view of perturbation theory between these two things. Okay. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, I will. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at what light operators, you, I mean, what local operators you can write in, uh, say, Wilson, Wilson Fisher field safety and uh, how they normalize IR divergences. Turns out that it's actually a nice way to compute anomalous dimensions for edge trajectories because you'll see the calculation is. I mean, to my taste, it's much simpler than the one you would do with local operators. Um, another point is that this discussion ties in with the fact that stress tensor doesn't get an anomalous dimension because stress tensor describes measuring energy to the first power. I erased it, but stress tensor just energy, measures energy flux and that's IR safe. So there is no IR divergence to renormalize and that's how we see that stress tensor doesn't get an anomalous dimension. Okay. So let me be now a little bit more concrete. Um, so let me say a bit more words about the space of local operators because, sorry, about the space of light ray operators. Because as I mentioned, we can analytically continue these guys in spin, but we can also construct them from local operators. It means that in principle, the space of light ray operator is connected to the space of local operators. And the way we usually draw this is using, using two fracture plots. So we plot, make a plot with one axis being the scaling dimension for convenience shifted by dimension over two, another axis being spin. And then for example, we know that the, we have a stress tensor at spin two with dimension d over, or with dimension d, in this coordinates will be d over two. And say in free theory, we will have a 45 degree line passing through it. And then at every even spin, they're going to find another local operator. And of course, there are going to be some trajectories with higher twist. And these trajectories, they do describe some light ray operators in free theory. So the light ray operator I mentioned, which uh, measure energy flux to some complex power J or say non-integer power J, uh, they live on this trajectory. So they are forced to pass through the local operators, but we also have the points which are defined in between. And as I said, for them, we will have eventually to renormalize our divergences, but the anomalous dimension that we'll get from this procedure, they should be compatible with anomalous dimensions that we already know for local operators. And so in principle, you would say that we can just go and look into, we can go and look at the, uh, all the formulas for anomalous dimensions that people have computed for local operators and multi continue them in spin and we get correct results. So for light operators, and this is correct, but actually even in these formulas, there are some, uh, so I'll just switch. I don't think they've been discussed before. So let me just give uh, an example of this connection very briefly, and then I'll explain exa more explicitly how the IR, IR divergences work. So we know for this twist two operators, the, the leading twist operators in four minus epsilon expansion, the curve delta of J is known to many perturbative orders. So it's something like J plus D minus two plus some anomalous dimension. And this anomalous dimension gamma of J 
starts at epsilon squared in the CFT. You get something like one over six minus one over J, J plus one. And then we get some high order corrections and we know everything up to order epsilon to the four, then epsilon to the five, I don't think is known. So in principle, you could say, okay, well, you know, if you want the, to know the anomalous dimension at j equals to pi, you just plug it in here and that's the correct answer. And that is the correct answer, but you can also spot an obvious problem with this formula because if you decide to plug in j equals zero, you get a pole and this result isn't valid, but I promise you that I can renormalize the R divergences of all light shot traders. And this contra contradicts this, this formula. So this formula somehow is not correct for j, j equals to zero. And this is well known that we cannot get the anomalous dimension of pi squared in this way. And you know, for j equals minus one, there is also a pole. So this formula works somewhere, but not everywhere. So one of um, it, it is related to this property of Lorentz inversion formula, but like just this property of Lorentz inversion formula is is the reason why I mean it's needed to be consistent, but this fact exists regardless of Lorentz inversion formula. It's just the anomalous dimension of the light operator. Um, yeah, with well, this fact about Lorentz inversion formula doesn't allow you to use a Lorentz inversion formula to derive the incorrect result that there is no pole, but you cannot show directly that there is a pole. I think. Uh, okay, so. As I'll explain now in the explicit renormalization, the reason why this happens is that this trajectory is not alone. And so near um, near d equals to four, it passes through j equals zero here through this intersection. And as many people in the, in the audience definitely know, on this plot, we're, also, we're supposed to add the shadow trajectories, which are the same trajectories as we have before, but flipped across the vertical axis. And then this trajectory intersects its shadow trajectory precisely at j equals to zero. And as we will see, this is the reason for, um, for this pole here. Also, it intersects shadows of other trajectories at other negative values of j, in particular at j equals minus one. And this will explain the pole at this value of j. So roughly speaking, these poles appear because there are mixing problems when you actually try to do the renormalization. We will see explicitly that trying to renormalize the leading trajectory, you'll get mixing with the shadow trajectories. And this is why this formula is not correct at this point. However, so if I were to look at higher Raji trajectories, would I find poles at positive values of j? Higher Raji trajectories. I mean, not the leading one, the subleading one. So J is this card and if you never find the intersections for a positive J, the intersections. Ah, yeah, you're yeah, right, sorry. But uh, yeah, like one thing you can do is you can look at the subleading terms in this formula and you'll see that it has false at all negative integer values of J. And if you look at uh, other formulas for other trajectories, you see the same pattern that they're false at the intersection points. But an interesting thing about this trajectory is um, that you can do a cheap magic trick because it intersects uh, with its shadow. And we think that the poles at j equals zero are because of this intersection. You can actually get rid of this pulse without doing any calculation. And the way you do this is you write an equation which describes the same bus trajectories at the same time. So this equation just describes one of the trajectories. If you write an equation, it describes two. And the way you do this, you basically take delta of j so you say delta minus d over two squared is equal to delta of j, d over two squared. So you just plug in this expression. Then you can take your gamma of j, plug in here, expand the right-hand side order by order in epsilon. And you'll find very non-trivially that to all known orders, all the poles of j equals zero cancel. 
So this expansion is perfectly regular at j equals zero. And for this, you don't need to do any new calculations. You just take the normal formula, you plug it in, expand. It's perfectly fine, j equals zero. And uh, you can get two funny things out of it. So one thing is now that you have uh, an equation for trajectories, which is perfectly regular at j equals zero, you can just plug in j equals zero. And if you set j equals to zero, then you actually can, uh, you find correct values for delta phi squared. So before you couldn't get delta phi squared from this formula after doing this skip trick, you start getting correct values for delta phi squared. Another thing you can do is you can find, you can set delta to be d over two and solve for j, and you find j naught, the red intercept. So what we think happens in this picture this is at least the standard law and which we confirm is that uh, as you turn on the interactions, this leading trajectory starts looking like this. And then we have another branch, which does this. And uh, this expression that you get here exactly gives you this shape. So it tells you that one of these intersections is a uh, phi squared. And if also gives you an expression for J naught. So you find something like the, the um, red J intercept in Wilson Fisher is something like, I always forget what this, one plus square root of two over three, epsilon plus dot, dot, dot. You can get higher order terms. Um, in fact, because this is known to so just using this formula, you can get up to epsilon to the power three. You lose one power of epsilon because of the subtlety that I'll mention later. But because you also know delta phi squared to extremely high order, like eight loops or something like this, you can actually feed from this calculation into here and add one extra power of epsilon and one extra loop order. So by doing the simple exercise, you can get actually five loop prediction for the Regi intercept in Wilson Fisher. Yeah. So the first thing you did just to say to verify the phi squared, how many orders do you plus? Uh, it's the same thing. You get you get up to epsilon to the third, but you find that the epsilon to the four is related between these two expansions. Like the thing that you don't know in order to compute epsilon to the four is the same thing for both guys because they both come from this kind of intersection here. And uh, yeah, so you since you know the answer for delta phi squared, you can compute this coefficient that you don't know and use it in, the, in J naught. Uh, no, it doesn't. It's uh, like here you'll get some order by order functions of J multiplying powers of epsilon. And what you need to predict this extra guys, the next, is like epsilon to the five part at j equals zero. And this is just epsilon to the five part of j equals zero, it enters into both expansions. But in general, it's not enough to know delta phi squared to predict anything else. So even, for example, even though I know delta phi squared to order like epsilon to the eight or something like this, I cannot use this to get any more mileage here without additional calculations. At least seven. It's one of these two numbers. It's not six. <laughs> that seven loops, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I imagine with some Borel summations, maybe yes. Um, okay, so let me say something more contentful than just manipulating known formulas. So not, not that I know of. Um, it's, I mean, first of all, it's not like, I don't know any obvious Euclidean data which they relate to. So usually the 
things that they show up in are some Lorenzian observables. And I don't know how to relate them to some states on anything. So it's kind of more dynamical, it seems. Okay, so you can get these things. And part of the result of the explicit calculation of the I divergence, it actually explains why this happens, why everything cancels in, in this expression. So the way we do this calculation is we say, um, well, imagine I want to compute quantities like I take vacuum, I take time ordered product of some number of field operators, and I don't want to take some scattering states because I know that that, that will have its own IR divergence and I don't want to mess things up. So I'm just going to take a time ordered product of a bunch of phi's off shell to create a state. Then I'm going to insert my elytra operator, which I'm call, going to call D for detector. Then I'm just going to get uh, you know, some kind of uh, bra state with anti-time ordering. The reason I'm doing time ordering and anti time ordering here is just to simplify Feynman diagrams. I could have done without time orderings, but that make more annoying Feynman diagrams because we know that time Feynman diagrams for time ordered products are simple, for Whiteman functions, they're not simple. So this is the minimal uh, annoyance that I can do. And I can explain how to compute these things in free theory. So, uh, and from this derive the Feynman rules for any kind of detector. For example, if I take dj to be the energy flux to the power j minus one, uh, then I can explain how to compute this using Feynman rules. And the Feynman rules are look something like this. You draw Feynman diagrams, which have two parts to them. So there's kind of a cut. You can draw interactions in the lower half or in the upper half. The detector operator is represented by a vertex on the cut with some vertex corresponding to it. And the Feynman rules in the lower half are the usual Feynman rules. Feynman rules in the upper half are the complex conjugate Feynman rules. Now, if I have propagators going from one side to another side, then they, this comes with Whiteman propagators to pi delta of p squared. And if you think about this rules, really what I'm doing here is just I'm competing a, a total cross section, but weighted by something on uh, one of the lines, which is precisely the thing that looks at the particles and ca counts their energies because this Whiten propagators, they simply put the particles on shell. Um, so you can either interpret this as particular Feynman rules for this kind of correlations, or you can think about this as uh, some weighted cross cross sections. Okay, so the vertex for for this uh, detector turns out to be so if you have some momentum p flowing in, then the vertex is uh, integral d beta from zero to infinity, beta to some power um, minus j l minus one plus one. Um, times delta function of p minus beta z, where z is a null vector, which I can use to parameterize the direction in which I'm looking at the flux. So I just make it to be one for my n, where n is some unit vector, which tells me in which direction I'm looking at the energy flux. So I can use this vertex. This is just the thing that you do get from uh, free theory. One way to get it is just take the null integral of the operator of spin j, do it over the fusion infinity and see what its matrix elements are. And you can check that they're computed by, by this vertex. Yeah, it's JL. So the difference between, I'll explain in a second what JL is. So a subtle point about these calculations is that um, they preserve things which you were not very used, that they preserve and they don't preserve things that we, I use that they preserve because in perturbation theory we have um, we have that trans like Poincaré group is exactly realized order like a like diagram by diagram let's say but conformal symmetry conformal transformations they get corrected so even if we tune to a fixed point we have some corrections to conformal transformations so you know the rotation operator gets corrected 
special conformal transformations get corrected. So one of the consequences is that if you want to renormalize some primary operator, you actually have to like correct the operator order by order by like to keep it primary, and you also have to um, think carefully about that. So here, because uh, I'm not going to say this in too much detail, but here it turns out that primary primariness condition turns out to be just the statement that this detector is translation invariant. So the primariness condition is that detector commutes with uh, the momentum generators instead of special conformal transformations. And this is because you can think about it as a primary operator inserted at spatial infinity. And what is uh, translation special? And translations are the special conformal transformations of the spatial infinity. Uh, so this is exact. You just impose it once and you don't have to worry about this constraint again. And another thing that is exact is, of course, the Lorentz group. So the thing that you fix can like specify because we have these trajectories and we need to tell where, like, what are we competing about this trajectory? Like, what point are we doing the calculations for? And the thing that you can specify is the Lorentz spin of the detector. But it turns out that if you work out the quantum numbers, so this is this Lorentz spin is what I denote here, JL. If you work out the quantum numbers, JL is not related to J. Instead, JL is equal to my, one minus delta. So in practice, in these calculations, what you do is you select a JL, so you select some vertical line, and then you're computing corrections to the scaling dimension of this operator to delta L, and delta L is one minus J. So you're computing corrections to spin, actually. So you're finding corrections in this direction. So this is the way calculations end up working. But of course, it gives the same information about the trajectory as in the local operator sense. Yeah. So this line just has two, this thing has two lines because it's quadratic and phi. So, yeah. Okay, so it's a slightly strange frame to think about these uh, objects, but it actually simplifies a lot of things. Uh, are there any questions about it? I, I'm not explaining in detail why this is correct because that would take a bit of time, but that's the idea. And then to, for example, what do we do to renormalize this leading to its trajectory? is just look at matrix elements of uh, in single phi states. So we have phi p, phi um, p. And just we use, of course, renormalized uh, phi's and we just try to find what we need to do to this DJ to make this uh, expectation values finite. And the diagram that you have to draw, basically the diagram which contributes to this uh, renormalization mainly is this sort of diagram, where you have two vertices and they do this. So in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, so this is the scat into two halves. So in terms of interpretation of uh, kind of weighted cross section, this is a cross section in which you have our particles split into two, into three particles, and uh, you just measure the energy on one of these particles, energy to the power of j, and or j minus one. And this is the thing that you expect to have the IR divergences. And if you go through all the diagrams that contribute here, this is the thing that's indeed divergent. The way it's divergent is uh, actually also quite unusual because you can write what the expression for this diagram is and there are no interesting propagators. So here, this vertex actually includes the propagator. So you don't need to add these propagators. And these propagators are just uh, delta of P squared. So the integral is quite easy to do. And in fact, it's fixed up to an overall factor by symmetry. So there is some coefficient that you can compute. And then there is a minus two P dot Z to the power JL 
And then there is minus p squared to the power d minus four over two plus, I think, yeah, minus jl minus two, and then some theta function of p, not theta function of p squared. So normally when we do calculations and we compute Feynman diagrams, we expect to have some gamma function of epsilon here and get our divergence from, from it. But in term, it turns out that this thing is finite. So there is no one over epsilon divergence in the coefficient. And to get the one over epsilon divergence, you actually have to stare at this expression. And the kind of one over epsilon divergence you get from this expression is the same uh, one as you get from is the same one as you get from expressions like one over absolute value of x to the power one minus epsilon. So if you imagine doing integrals of such functions, dx f of x, then it's a standard exercise to prove that this is We'll always have one over epsilon in it times f of zero plus something finite in that. So something finite at epsilon goes to zero. So in other words, what we can write is that this function is one over epsilon times delta of x plus corrections plus finite part. And thinking about integrating this answer with respect to p makes sense because we actually only want we want this guy to be, give us a finite result if we actually uh, make a state out of it. So phi of p is not a state. Phi of p acting in vacuum is not a state. To get a state, you need to smear with some test function, and uh, you should be able to choose any test function. And it turns out that this expression has this kind of structure, but it's not obvious from the way it's written that it does. And it's a funny calculation we should do in our paper. But you can prove that this expression here in the end has something like this in it, inside of it, one over epsilon. There is some pi over JL plus one. And then we get basically this vertex. So getting from here to here is a bit more sophisticated version of this analysis. And you see that the divergence, uh, there is one over epsilon divergence. If you think about it, you can attribute it to an IR divergence and the divergence is proportional to the tree level vertex. And so if you uh, subtract this, kind of subtract this, do this multiplicative, multiplicative renormalization with this coefficient and whatever comes from here on dj, and then do the usual tricks, you will recover the anomalous dimension uh, for the leading twist trajectory, but in some unusual coordinates where you work in terms of this JL and Delta L. Any questions about this? This is an IR diversion, which is regulated by epsilon. So this still doesn't uh, solve this problem with the intersection where we had to do this trick and uh, where the trajectory is supposed to kind of bend in some non-trivial way. And this actually is uh, coming from this factor here. So the pole that I was complaining about in the anomalous dimension is coming from this pole here, because if you think about it a little bit, then uh, this intersection near d equals four is delta approximately two. So this is approximately minus one. So this is the place where we had problems. And so this blow, blows up near that point. And the reason it blows up is that actually this, uh, this expression, which is the correct answer for this diagram, just has more singularities in the parameters than, uh, than just the singularities epsilon goes to zero. Uh, 
So this is another unusual feature. And this new singularity, I can actually easy, explain very easily. So if you look at uh, this factor here, it's precisely, it can do precisely what this thing does here. So before I said that the way I interpret this expression is by saying that maybe I can write it this way, that x to the power minus one plus, let's say delta is one over delta, uh, maybe not delta, let's call it, okay, let's call it a one over a delta of x. So here, if I if I see that J approaches, um, JL approaches D minus six over two, which for D equals four is, is exactly minus one. I can see that I have precisely this kind of fall coming from, uh, from this factor because this power approach is minus one. So by thinking about it, I get that the same expression also has a pole of the form one over JL minus D minus six over two times minus two Z dot E to the power JL, well, times delta of P squared. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to show this explicitly, but what you can check is that this is precisely the tree level vertex for uh, D tilde uh, D minus six over two, where D tilde, I use D tilde to denote operators which live on this shadow trajectory. So we see that this matrix element, a two loop has a divergence, the two loops has a divergence, and I can write explicitly that it has lambda squared to the power of two epsilon, it has a divergence which is proportional to the tree level vertex, to the tree level matrix element of the shadow trajectory. The interesting thing that happens here is that it's not one of epsilon divergence, and this divergence actually happens for any value of epsilon, it happens for a special value of JL. And the, this particular special value, it's kind of weird number D minus six over two, but what happens at this number is that this is precisely when the, this value is the precise the value of spin when the, um, so if I label my detectors by JL by their spin, when both the detector and the shadow detector have such mass dimensions so that when I can put mu to the when I put mu to the power two epsilon here, that this man's, this formula makes sense. So the divergence happens precisely when it can happen. So in general, you know my uh, so the mass dimension of these operators, as I said, delta L is related to the vertical position. If I'm sitting in general point like here, the shadow detector and the original detector have vastly different scaling dimension. But as I get closer here their kind of engineering mass dimension can become a further epsilon. And when it becomes further epsilon, it can be made up for by this mu to the power to epsilon. And then this formula can make sense. And then you actually find that there is a divergence and they do mix. So the way you supposed to treat this is that you need to subtract these divergences in the same way you subtract one over epsilon divergences. And the reason for that is that you know, if you work at epsilon, which is not zero, which is what we want to do, we don't need to subtract anything. Everything is finite. It's just that if we don't do subtractions, then our perturbation theory is going to have one over epsilon in it. It's not going to be a useful perturbation theory. So we improve this perturbation theory by doing this subtractions of one over epsilon things. And this is the same story, it's just a different parameter. So in the end, we need to subtract uh, from our operator do a normalization where we subtract uh, a shadow trajectory from it. So in other words, if you want to define a, we want to define a renormalized version of our detector. So if DJL 
renormalized, in the end, we need to do something like BJL, but also subtract uh, lambda squared you need to the power to epsilon or J L minus D minus six over two. Um, times this tree level, well, times the shadow operator with spin D minus six over two. But if you try doing that, there is a problem that this breaks everything at the same time. This breaks uh, even tree level kind of engineering mass dimensions, because as we change JL, this is mass dimension of this guy is going to change. This guy stays fixed. So I'm just subtracting, roughly speaking, this times the operator for which this is the tree level vertex. So because I'm sitting on the pole, I can replace JL by D minus six over two. And if I do this, this is bad because I'm adding things which have different Lorentz spins. And also they have different mass dimensions. So I need to fix this formula. And the way, the only way to fix this formula is to replace this by JL. And then here do something correct also so that it actually the mass dimensions make sense. So in that you need to do a subtraction of this form. And even though the trajectory is intersected, just the, the mixing happened just at one point, you're forced to mix the trajectories for all JL if you want to know this in spin. Sorry? Yeah, so you can ignore this and don't do this. Um, and it's going to be fine. In particular, actually, so there is some scheme choice where you can uh, multiply it by any function of JL as long as it's one at this point. Also, you can just ignore this. It's going to be fine, but it's not going to allow you to, ta to take uh, JL closer to minus one, like, you know, if you don't do this, your expressions are going to be correct in the limit where JL stays fixed and you send epsilon to zero. But if you do this, you're allowed to take double scaling limit when you send JL to minus one and epsilon to zero at the same time. So if you do this, you'll recover this shape of the intersection in the regi intercept and so on. If you don't do this, you'll get expressions which are valid only away from this point. So, so when you do these subtractions, and if you fix JL to some fixed number, which is away from the intercept and you take epsilon small, turns out that this is not doing anything. Um, but if you kind of have JL on order, JL plus one on order epsilon, then this is actually non-trivial. It, it depends, like it doesn't do anything if JL is just a constant. You're, like all you're doing is you're working in a weird basis of, uh, of operators. Um, but if JL becomes actually close to this value, then it becomes important. So, so this is the lowest order, and I think at higher orders we expect that it would be the same as with one over epsilon thing. So there's going to be higher order poles so that you're also going to be subtract. That's just... there is a higher order pole. So, so is that some kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, precisely. So this like res this kind of thing is supposed to resum. Uh, uh, in the end, kind of double logs in the regu limit, for example. Um, yeah, so you have to subtract this. You also, this guy is still there as well. So you have to actually subtract both at the same time, but you can do this. It's, uh, there is nothing con conceptually new here. It's like, you just need, to, you know, the original expression, which was written here, which I erased, it just had pulse and JL and epsilon, you just have to subtract both of this pulse. Um, and then you can get the renormalized operator. Um, there is a slight subtlety, which is still not fixed by this, which is that if you set JL exactly to this symmetric value, because JL fixes the horizontal position. So if you set exactly on the axis, uh, 
turns out that the operators, the vertices for uh, the shadow guy and the original guy exactly the same. So the basis is degenerate. So to get to completely the final answer, you need to define, you don't need to work not in the basis of D tilde and D, but you need to work in the base, for example, of D and uh, another operator, which you form out of D and D tilde so that you actually get a non-degenerate basis of the intercept. So something like phi D prime JL to be D tilde JL minus D JL with some factors of mu to make up the scaling dimension and you divide by JL minus two minus D over two, so that when you set JL to two minus D over two, you actually get kind of a, a good basis and not a degenerate one. So once you do that, then you can get a dilatation operator in the basis of DJL and DJL prime, which is perfectly regular uh, next to this intercept point. It still will have singularities from other intersections, but this intersection point now will be completely uh, resolved and you'll get a finite dilatation operator in its vicinity. And the equations that I was writing from by, by just combining the known results and observing that singularities cancel, that equation becomes just the characteristic equation for this dilatation operator. So as long as you uh, are able to do this subtractions order by order, you'll get this dilatation operator and its characteristic equation, you can compute from the known expansions in the way that uh, I showed in the beginning. So what we were doing in the beginning by taking that square of that expression that was just computing the characteristic equation for this two, two by two Hamiltonian. How much time do I have? Minus five? Well, we didn't start exactly at two. Uh, let me just say in words that uh, another thing that we did in this paper, which we didn't manage to talk about, was that we found that these plots actually have also horizontal trajectories, which go like this. So th th they're analogous to BFKL trajectory and gauge theories, which go at spin equal to one. Uh, it turns out that in scalar theories, you can have horizontal trajectories at j equals to minus one. You, you can find, and that, that actually makes sense, you can find their uh, presence in uh, correlation functions explicitly. You can go to back to some papers on conformal fishnets where they have some of the rigid trajectories exactly, and you can find horizontal trajectories there, even though they did, don't discuss them. And here, it seems kind of, in this plot, it seems like some sort of subleading, maybe not very interesting trajectory because it sits at spin minus one. But if you go into other symmetry sectors, like if you look at Z2 odd operators or even worse, parity odd operators, then in this sector is the leading trajectory has much higher twist. So this get these guys kind of move out and intersect lower. Whereas these guys always are there at J equals minus one and all lower J's as well. And so if you look um, if you look in let's say some parity odd sector at the regular trajectories, then what you'll find at tree level actually is that you have this uh, leading twist guys which intersect, but they intersect very low. And the regi intercept is actually determined by some horizontal trajectory at j equals minus. So, and we kind of discussed these trajectories in our paper and but they turn out to be much more subtle than this leading one. We do some renormalization for them, but we don't understand what's kind of all loop story. Uh, we don't have like here for the leading trajectory, we have an expectation how it's supposed to work. For these guys, we don't even, even have an expectation of how they're supposed to work. And the reason for that is that they're infinitely degenerate, they're infinitely many trajectories at this value. So uh, I'll stop here. Thanks. Yes. And it looks like a double epsilon expansion. Now you have two independent epsilon parameters and you have to make the theory regular. You take any of them to zero. Sorry, is double epsilon expansion a thing that I don't know about or it's uh, your way of- One example I know is if you take dimensional manifold with some- Sorry, with what? 
D-dimensional manifold with self-avoidance, which is uh -huh. a generalization of the self-avoiding polymer. And then there is a competing point at the internal dimension of four thirds, where you have the three point uh, repulsion and the second derivative of the two point repulsion compete. Uh -huh. So then you have two uh, dimensions you can tweak. I mean, embedding dimension, inner dimension, with two epsilon parameters. Mm -hmm. and it... Yeah, it, it sounds similar. I think it's perhaps maybe in both cases, just the statement that uh, you can regularize some things. Well, in my mind, the way it works is that both the usual epsilon expansion and uh, this kind of regularization, what you end up having if you just don't do any regularization and just compute things, you're in the end end up having things like uh, and one over x to one minus a, where a it can be epsilon, it can be this j l plus one, but in the case when a is small, uh, this function, even though it's not obvious, becomes large in very precise sense, and you're just get trying to get rid of this large piece. So in principle, in retrospect, it's not clear why it had to be just epsilon, why epsilon had to be enough in all cases, but here this new parameter appears. So I guess it's similar to that. Yeah, so you, you promised at the beginning some physical understanding of what uh, what these measurements are, and I think I didn't get uh, quite the message. So it looks like a leading order in epsilon, for instance, you're measuring maybe one the energy cube of one particle out of three, but then at sublinear order in epsilon there would be like two particle out of six or whatever, right? So is is there how, how much further? Okay. How much more do we know about the physical? What do I need to put on the table that you were drawing before in order to measure these things? Well, I, I, I think it's kind of the other way around. You put something, and then you should use these things to describe your measurement, and. Uh, in case of energy measurement, for example, it's something clearly universal where you're just measuring conserved current. But in other examples, it doesn't have to be like that. Um, so, for example, one part of the statement that local operators describe local measurements is that if you take two local operators, bring them close to each other, you'll get uh, you can expand this in local operators. So these guys satisfy the same kind of P expansion. So, for example, if you take two energy. Uh, measurements and bring them close to each other, you get an OP, light ray OP expansion in detectors. Yeah, so it's like the interpretation is that you should use light ray operators or detectors, which is what we're trying to say are the same thing, um, to like take your favorite asymptotic measurement and expand in this basis and this, this prediction and the anomalous dimension that you get from this process um, they're going to describe like a resummation of some logs in, in this measurement, like logs of an angle, something like this, at perturbative level. Non perturbatively, they would determine some uh, some exponents and some dependencies of, on angles or something like this. Question. Uh, in, in the nonlinear sigma model, there were old calculations where they showed that uh, if you take high gradient operators and epsilon fixed, then you can just increase the number of gradients on this, and the nonlinear sigma model becomes unstable. Um, then it had been argued that, well, I mean, in the epsilon expansion, probably you should take epsilon smaller if you take more number of gradients. I think that's a, a question you could probably also settle with this uh, technique. Um, number of gradients in in the kinetic term. The the nonlinear sigma model, O n say O n nonlinear sigma model. Yes, is unstable to operators uh, which have a lot of gradients. Ah, I see. I mean, the, the the there's a power counting term which is linear on the number of gradients, which is uh -huh, fine, uh -huh, which makes uh -huh. them irrelevant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the problem is that the uh, the nonlinear correction is actually quadratic in the number of uh, gradients. Yeah, I think I, so. I, this I, kills I, this. Yeah, so but then I, you can argue, I mean, okay, maybe I should take epsilon very small and then the problem yeah. would go away. I mean, small is a function of n. So yeah, I think you could maybe say something that too. Yeah, maybe you need to subtract like uh, k squared times some, some, some like renormalized by function of k uh, of the number of gradients. 
to, to, to do some kind of resummation. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Can you study also PEs in this uh, framework of, of these objects? Um, so we, we, we have a general statement for OPEs of like two now integrated local operators, um, which doesn't rely on this, just relies on Lorenz inversion formula. Uh, that's in previous papers. In this context, I imagine you could also study OPEs in the same sense that you can study OPEs local operators perturbatively, but we haven't done this. Yeah, the way you do construct BFKL things, uh, like the way you can construct BFKL trajectories, you take uh, two null Wilson lines from the same null plane. Um, let me do it here. So you can construct, you take a null plane, like x minus equals to zero. You put two Wilson lines, kind of. Sort of. So this is like y bar, and you construct the corresponding light trail operator schematically as some kind of smearing over y1, uh, y2 trace of. And then basically here, you just write the three point function for y1, y2, and some y, and you get to choose a part one of the parameters in this three point function for conformal invariance. And uh, this parameter gives you a traject a co coordinate on this line. So you choose where on this line you are by tuning one parameter in the sway function as each smear. And the way you get the horizontal trajectories in scalar theories is that you replace a uh, Wilson line uh, by null integral of a scalar operator or phi squared, for example. So if you do that, uh, turns out this construction still works. Quantum numbers are slightly different, so it actually pushes the um, pushes the horizontal trajectory to spin minus one. Oh, sorry, but with Kel, I don't remember on top of my head. For this horizontal trajectory, if you do renormalization, the Feynman diagrams are like the diagram which contributes is. Um, something like this, where these guys, there, there are two vertices which come from the two null integrals of pi that enter into the, into the operator. Okay, let's thank Heather again.